Okay, we're ready to go. Yes. Yeah. Were you okay, Frank? Okay, uh, Mr. Okay. Moffitt, will you open the meeting, please? I'll read the statement of compliance. This meeting is being held in conformity to the Open Public Meeting Act. Proper public notice of the meeting was published in the local newspapers on May 1, 2015 and May 3, 2015. If any board member or member of the public in attendance believes that this meeting is in, the vi in violation of the Open Public Meeting Act, the Hoboken Board of Education requests that they make a statement at this time. The board wishes to make those in attendance aware that this meeting is being recorded on video and will be broadcast by the board at a later date on cable television channel 44 and Fios channel 46. The Hoboken Board of Education is committed to preserving the decorum of the public process and is mindful that we live in the electronic age of computers, cell phones, and other electronic communication devices. Nevertheless, we respectfully request that all meeting participants kindly silence their electronic devices during the course of the meeting, and if use of the device is necessary, we ask that you please leave the meeting room if you need to conduct personal business. You can please rise for the salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call? <laughs> it's usually me that forgets. <laughs> My apologies. Ms. Angley? Here. Mr. Biancamano? Present. Ms. Evans? Here. Dr. Gold? Here. Mr. Klubfell? Here. Ms. Mitchell? Here. Ms. Sobolov? Here. Ms. Stromwall? Here. And Ms. Tyroller? Here. Okay, and now on to our budget presentation. Thank you, Mr. Moffat. Not sure if you want to. Yeah. Hello. Oh yeah, if the board wants to move. Are we on? We're still on, right? Okay. Thanks for coming out tonight. I know it's uh, I'm competing with Cinco de Mayo, but I appreciate everyone's coming down. Um, where are we on the adoption of the budget? Um, just so everyone knows in the audience, we submitted this budget, which is district budget, to the New Jersey Department of Education, Hudson County office. It has been approved. Uh, there was very, very little, there was actually no changes. It was just additional information that they uh, had inquired about. So uh, it, there's really nothing to report out here at, as far as um, major changes to the numbers or any of that. So that's good. Um, there will be additional detail coming out uh, after the presentation as we continue to uh, update the adopted budget book, which is something we implemented uh, this past year for our budget. So we'll be updating that and reissuing the adopted budget book. So a lot of information you see here tonight and some of you that were here last time, so last uh, meeting on the budget, um, we'll have additional information in there giving you a lot more detail. So, um, so like I said, it was approved and what that approval from the department allows us to do is advertise in a newspaper, which it ran as well as uh, provide information to you tonight. Now, um, if there are things here that we want to change tonight, we can do that. Um, I don't recommend those at this stage, but if there was anything uh, that we needed to address, uh, we could do that tonight before it was adopted, but we'll be taking a vote on that later today um, and tonight after the presentation. So um, off we go. The five major items didn't change from the last time we talked about this. What, what are the five major areas that I'm concerned about every year since I've, I've been in district? One is the uh, use of surplus for a uh, source of revenue for the future budget. That was one issue. Uh, second issue was the food service deficit. Uh, there's another one that I call and lump it in with a big uh, statement, but it's uh, aging facilities, uh, which uh, 
provides a lot of challenges to the district, uh, as well as issues that are related to being a former Abbott uh, district. Um, and the last one being um, planning for uh, the charter school allocation. Every year there's been a, a ramped up expenditure related to charter schools, so that is a, a major influence on our budget as far as increase from year to year. So those are the five major areas that hasn't changed. Now those are overarching goals that we have, is to address those various areas, but this basically happened to us this past year, uh, since we approved this year's budget, which is 14-15. Uh, we were faced with some pretty big challenges that influenced planning for the future year, which is 15-16, what we're talking about tonight. Uh, one of which is the loss of state aid after our budget was struck, is about $670,000. Uh, that's important because that uh, one option was to offset that to our surplus. So that's something that uh, I recommend and we, we follow through with. What does that mean for the future budget is I have less budget on hand to deal with the future budget. So that was one issue right out of the gate. Um, we also were given an update uh, around November, which increased our charter school uh, payment. Now we get a, um, a printout with the state aid every year from the department that we must allocate in our budget. We did that. Um, they will revise that payment amount after the October 15 count, which is the ASSA count. This year they did that. We received that revision, in, like I said, in November, and that was an increase of about $217,000. Again, resources that I didn't anticipate providing to, uh, for this uh, allocation again with the charter schools. So that was one issue that revealed itself. Another one uh, was a positive. It has to do with rental income. We were able to uh, raise rent, I should say, uh, collect rent from preschool providers. So we did have a shot in the arm, which was additional research, uh, excuse me, uh, additional revenue of about 267,000. Uh, but then we also found out that we may be losing one of our tenants, uh, which was uh, Elysian Charter School. So that was gonna have a little bit of an impact again, moving forward, because these are revenue projections you look at every year. So that was something that happened uh, as I was planning this year's budget. As with every budget, and the longer you listen to my budget presentations, this is a, a common uh, planning uh, process. So we look at various different trends. We look at um, enrollment. We look at the historical spending patterns of various units, like the um, individual schools. We look at uh, the charter school allocation, we look at uh, costs to run our facilities, trends, um, either upward trends or downward trends. We hope that some of that balances out year to year, uh, but then we have to worry about absorbing uh, some of those trends if it's a net increase. So again, th that's just common 101 budgeting. Um, the next major area that we deal with is the salaries. Um, as the 12 month employees Start on July 1, we start building our projections for salary. Uh, we look at our units, our collective bargaining units. We have three administrators, uh, teachers, and other school employees, as well as administrators that um, what I'll call at will. So we have to uh, concern ourselves with projecting enrollment, uh, I should say uh, salary growth in the future year. We look at en enrollment trends. Uh, we do go out for a third party uh, demographic study. The second year we've done that just to make sure we know where to hone in on what are the grade levels that we have to be worried about as far as covering uh, any type of growth that uh, we can identify. So um, we'll be going more specifically over those uh, inf that information soon. And then uh, in this year, uh, knowing that it was gonna be extremely tough, uh, we had the concept of what a maintenance budget to see if we can maintain what we have. So that was big. Um, and as the schools start, um, finishing their orders, it's September, October, we get a sense of where their spending is. So that's what we try to do is confirm what we call the base so we can project into the next uh, fiscal year or budget year. Some of the residual um, programs or offerings, I'll say, that is unique to uh, Hoboken and specifically the Abbott v. Burke Group, uh, formerly known as Abbott Districts. These are some of the programs that we have, we're mandated to have. Uh, we have school-based budgeting, which is a way we craft our budget, and I'll get into that a little bit more. We have mandated school-level programs, uh, tutoring, parent at outreach activities, field trips, and uh, certain after-school programs. Uh, we're required to have a preschool program, which is a separate and distinct 
uh, budget, meaning it's a restricted fund. We uh, deal with what they call the school development authority or not deal with them, uh, although we do have some activity with the branch school with this agency, but uh, we cannot just go out and raise bonds for our facilities, the state of New Jersey, uh, through the uh, Abbott v. Burke uh, uh, rulings, I'll say, uh, the state of New Jersey is responsible for what we need to, to use in a thorough and efficient education, basically facilities that are instruction related. They have to fund 100%. So we have the, ple uh, the pleasant task of dealing with that agency and uh, full day kindergarten. That is something that we're, we're required to have. The state of New Jersey are only required by law, if you're not an Abbott district, to have a half a uh, uh, well, a half day pre K. Uh, I should say half day kindergarten, my mistake. Enrollment assumptions, again, uh, it's a five year study. Uh, we noticed that we had about 81 students, which is a 3.29% increase. So we were concerned about where that was going to hit. Uh, we noticed that the areas that we were focusing in on are elementary schools. Kindergarten, again, uh, proves to be uh, an incoming uh, grade level every year that is at the 40. Uh, student range, so that was a concern, as well as the elementary level, which would be an additional 20 students. Middle school is relatively flat. High school looks like about 10 students in the positive, and we look to see to have about four um, students in out-of-district settings. That's again, that's what we're projecting. This is the way it looks. Again, this is a demographic study, it matches up, and that was entered into the software to, to create uh, the budget. Uh, so you have 17 from kindergarten uh, to, uh, should actually be 912, and then we have the four uh, out of district placements. Now, special education is uh, separate because the way we do the enrollment projections, they classify special ed as ungraded, so we don't technically know where they'll fall, but we do know we probably have around nine to 10. Of that 10, we think about nine will be out of district placements. The others would be either mainstreamed or they may just be an IEP for uh, maybe reading or, or some OTPT type services. Charter, charter school assumptions. Um, again, this year we received in our state aid notice that uh, we had uh, an increase. So we have the OLA expansion, which will bring about 46 new students to uh, that charter school. You also have the others, Hoboken Charter School is also pushing about 20, so that's a total of 79 um, students, which is significant. Um, and again, it's significant because OLA is expanding. We were advised that we have to budget for that expansion. So that is in the numbers on the enrollment side. And then it will also be found on the payment side, which is the transfer from our budget to these various charter schools. What we do is we do a, uh, we cut what they call purchase order and we pay them monthly according to these amounts. Again, like I said, it's all subject to change. We could, uh, there's uh, that uh, November change, meaning update, it could go up or down. Uh, and then we get the final adjustment, which comes in roughly March, sometime after March, we'll get that last one, which is really the final uh, adjustment. Um, so there's, there's your uh, increases according to charter schools. So the biggest uh, increase you'll see is the OLA, and Hoboken Charter School is second to that. Now over time, this is what it looks like. This is a significant increase. It's like 80, I think it's 80%, from 4 million to, to 9 million. <clears throat> again, if I could point out that 8.4 in the column with the 15 budget, again, that was more than 200 less when I budgeted. So that's how it can creep up on you. Now, once I finish with the charter schools, the salaries, I start looking at the non-salary, and where does that bring me? It brings me to what they call school-based budgets. Um, majority of our instructional expenses will be carried in that school-based budget. Each school has their own um, uh, plan, as they say, and, and things that are uh, priorities for th their sites. So uh, when we sit with the uh, principals, we go over and make sure all these uh, items are covered, not only from a, a from a resource, meaning teachers are covering, but also that they have uh, materials like textbooks or workbooks. Um, and in case of science, uh, you'll see some science kits. So uh, we're looking for making sure everyone has their Singapore math, reading wonders, time links, eye science, and the FOSS materials. We'll go over specifically their site enrollment where they see any changes. Uh, we will discuss about needs of, uh, for teachers, for classrooms, those type of setup 
costs if they have that. Sometimes it's a matter of just moving one teacher from one grade level to another to offset an increase in enrollment. And then if there's any other additional existing programs that we have to worry about making sure that they have resources. So that might include art, music, and world language type uh, activities. Spe special education, uh, once I finish with the schools, we discuss uh, the budget with our director. Uh, we go over a lot of what is in her budget. Uh, she is required to budget for areas of services that are for evaluation, speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, any other type, type of medical service, one-on-one -on -one nurses, those type of things. That would be found in the IEP, which is individual educational uh, plan for each individual student. And a lot of those required services would be uh, identified uh, in those plans. Again, we have to make sure all the resources are available in her budget to cover those costs that we anticipate. Uh, some of the items that popped up this year was, again, this is a federal uh, initiative, which is to get every student into the less restrictive or least restrictive environment. So if it means bringing them back to district in a, in a least restrictive environment, we will take them back in from an out-of-district placement, which is considered to be more restrictive. But we're always looking for ways to do that. Uh, if that means expanding our own program offering, we'll try to do that. If it's a, it's a matter of adding an additional resource or service, we'd like to do that as well. Uh, so some of the things that we talked about was the a ABA program, the autistic program at Wallace and Junior Senior High School. Uh, another way to bring students back to the community would be through an extended school year program. It is an additional, like, we'll say summer school, but it's an additional potentially 20 days over the summer. We'll try to run those programs here and expand that to absorb more kids from out-of-district out placements. Again, you can go in-district or out-of-district for extended year programs. And we make sure that uh, all the self-contained classroom uh, needs are, are addressed in each individual school-based budget as well as resource centers. So for students that are mainstreamed, they rely on uh, the resource centers. Uh, so what does this resource center mean? I might have to have a more, more grade ranges as it relates to uh, like textbooks for math or, or language arts. So we just go over that, make sure everybody has what they need. Technology, park was a big discussion this year. We're, we were ahead of the curve in this sense but with the money that we received due to the, uh, the Sandy Grant. So we were able to upgrade a lot of the, the Wi-Fi coverage and our network. Uh, we want to continue to, to expand that, not only for testing purposes, but just to get back, I should say, expand uh, the existing technology in the classrooms, expand that out. Um, so we sit with the technology director, we go over what he needs, basically uh, a cycle for computers. So if we're trying to get a, a three-year cycle going, we're in se the second year of that three-year cycle. Uh, we want to make sure they have the capacity to provide desktop support, network support in the event we have a problem, um, as well as uh, computer devices like iPads, printers, um, handheld devices, iPads, those type of things. Um, and again, we wanted to maximize our investment that we made with the Hurricane Sandy grant. Uh, the the this three-year cycle, it's about 100 a year we're trying to plan. Um, so we were in the second phase of that. So we were looking at $100,000 in that area. Again, this will go to desktop computers. May go for some network gear, some switches, and some servers. So these are things that we're looking at from an inventory standpoint, see what's older, so we could cycle them out. So if a server is three, five years old, we may decide to get a new one and to keep a spare on hand. Again, those are things that uh, we look at for that lease purchase. Security, again, we're always looking to expand our security cameras and exterior doors, making them better. Um, again, those are things that we monitor closely. Facilities, these are the things that people don't see from day to day. Uh, I was laughing about it before, but it's like things in the wall people don't know about. Uh, but this is heating and ventilation systems, electric, water, those type of uh, systems in the building have to be maintained or uh, uh, repaired from time to time. There may be some replacements. So uh, Tim Gahalagi, the uh, facility director, that's his day in and day out uh, purpose, I'll say. Uh, but on top of these uh, facility systems, I'll use it's the fire alarm system. You also have uh, fire extinguishers, pre preventative maintenance programs that he has to continue and uh, we obviously have insurance costs associated. And he's also involved in getting FEMA money. We're still working on some of the FEMA money that is remaining to get uh, dispersed to the district. We do have an application for more than what uh, they were gonna give us for one of our projects. So we're in the process of expanding that and asking for some additional funds. 
And uh, the SDA funds, as I said, the School Development Authority is moving forward with Brant. So hopefully on the 12th, we'll be able to even move farther down the line with that one. And again, that's all part of the facility area. Uh, I mentioned this uh, earlier, this is the food service deficit. We made some pretty good headway this past year. Not only did we have an operating reserve, which is money in our budget, current budget to cover what we think uh, may have been uh, a deficit. And we were able not only to absorb that, we had more to put towards the accumulated portion of that. But we also were able to make uh, an appropriation from existing surplus to re further reduce that. So uh, the county office was impressed with that as well as our auditor and, and we would like to stick with it. So that, that's again, that's our plan to do again this year. We have our, um, about $200,000 in reserve for that in our operating budget. And if we could add additional resources to that at the end of the year, we would like to do that. Appropriations in total. Now, uh, this is a, an increase. It's about $1.2 million. Uh, I will point out when you look at some of our advertised information, if you put in year, uh, year uh, prior year encumbrances, that will be reduced to about uh, somewhat of a decrease, about $250,000. But the way I look at it is if you hold that, because encumbrances are uh, things from the prior year, obviously. But uh, potentially, if I'm carrying a purchase order for $50,000 and I only need 25 of that, that gets closed out. So when we finish the fiscal year, that may wash out and be be basically uh, less than anticipated. So it really shouldn't have any impact on the budget. So I usually try to neutralize that in these slides. Um, but when you look at the actual uh, data in the newspaper, it'll be a little different. It'll match up to the $250,000 number. But uh, again, that's about 2.36 is that million two push in the general fund. Now general fund is our operating budget. That's where a majority of our expenditures are carried. And it's, uh, they're less restrictive in, in, those, uh, in that fund, which is the general fund. Now, as I uh, sat and went through uh, everybody's needs and wants uh, for 15-16, um, what they had wanted as part of their budget, uh, we had to go back and reduce them and eliminate them from the discussion uh, just to make it back into uh, balance. So these are some of the items that came up in those uh, discussions. Uh, teachers, as you know, we had uh, the pushes at the uh, elementary level, kindergarten, the fifth grade, so we were anticipating and probably would need around two FTEs for that, so about $150,000 there, that would be salary and benefits. Uh, elementary school specialists, which would allow uh, for uh, potentially art, music, those type of specialized uh, instructional services that we need at that level. Uh, we were hoping to have that, that's about $75,000 estimate. Applied behavior specialists, we were wanting to expand that autistic ABA program at Wallace and uh, the junior senior high school. Unfortunately, we couldn't afford it this year, so that was, was uh, eliminated. Uh, BD was, is a big uh, classification that we notice uh, when we uh, look at all of our, our uh, special ed students. If we could build a BD program, we could bring more students back to district, uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't afford that one either, so uh, that was eliminated. Uh, to continue to gather the information for special education, as well as balance needs of the, the, the children in district as far as evaluation and other type of testing services, uh, it was uh, requested that we have a child study team member. Uh, unfortunately, couldn't uh, afford that. Technology was big. As Park rolled out, uh, there was a need at each school level. We're hoping to address it through use of grant money, but. Uh, the idea was let's get mobile technology where we can make best use of it and roll it into a classroom, plug it in, and use it for testing or other type of activities. They're very popular this year, uh, but again, uh, can't afford it in uh, our general fund, so that was eliminated. And then we went back to the facility area. We, we left some in, and we'll get to that in a minute, but we had to eliminate these two projects, which had to do, deal with our food service operation. They were just basically kitchen upgrades. We were going to replace some, um, some equipment. Instead of replacing them, we were going to use them another year or so. So hopefully they'll stick with us for a while. Again, it's just taking a, pushing the risk out a little bit farther. Uh, items that are still in. Our after school program, we're still working on that. Um, the reason that's in is it doesn't really use resources from our general fund. It's funded from our NCLB grant, so that's still part of the budget. Enrichment programs, also funded with our NCLB uh, funds, that's still in the budget, and that'll start in July, obviously, it's the summer. Um, so that's both covered by our grants. 
This is the band camp and theater arts camp. We found some residual uh, budget dollars in this year's 2014-15 um, budget. So we were able to offer this this coming year, which is 15-16. So we're looking forward to reinstituting the band camp and offering a theater arts camp program. And uh, these two facility programs were considered higher priorities than the other two, and obviously they're a little bit more expensive. So we have the Brandt bathrooms, and then we have the pool ceiling uh, replacement. This is what uh, is, uh, this isn't what I call very user-friendly. It's a favorite word of the department. Um, this is a very global look. It's all the difference and variances between um, our budget. Um, it, You'll see um, when you get the adopted budget book, you'll have supporting schedules that will break this down in more detail. Um, I'll just, I'm just going to go point a few things out. Uh, if you look at a lot of the uh, instruction up top is million eight. That doesn't seem like a lot for a district like Hoboken, but that's just a portion. Those are aides and RTI type teachers. Majority of our instructional expenses, again, they're covered in the school-based budgets. So this comes to 20 million, you'll have to add in the school-based budget portion, which is on the top third, and, and that's about $23.4 million. So that's the school-based budget, the summary of all of our schools. So I wanted to let you know, and then there is the charter school transfer. And above that, <clears throat> excuse me, is the capital outlay. The meat in the middle, uh, is more of a restricted. You have other state projects. There are a lot of non-public aid flow through dollars. You have state projects which represent the $12.8 million is the early childhood program. And then the federal projects which would be the NCLB and the IDEA funds. Um, so we try to give you a nice little pie chart to address visually some of the percentages. So instruction uh, could be labeled instruction slash school-based budgets, but that not only does it include instruction, it also includes like nursing, education, uh, what they call the uh, librarian, uh, ed media specialist, those type of school-specific expenditures that are supporting the instructional delivery. That would be that 44%. Again, that's school-based budgets. You see the other instruction at 7%, uh, and then I'll point out the charter school transfer, that 17%. And again, this just a little note, this is, does not include the early childhood program. Now in sitting with the board over the past few days and week, um, there's a request for something simplistic that people can leave here tonight and say, well, I kind of understand a little bit better. So we try to do that in this slide. So it's a resource and use, so it's a, a way that we generated money and where, we, where it went in the budget. So what you'll see, and I'm going to get into the, re the revenue side and resources side a little bit more, but uh, you have a tax levy increase. So the increase in tax levy is the million six. We have additional rental income, which is the pre-K providers. That's the net increase, which is the uh, 219. And then we had some increase in state and federal aid. So uh, we'll get there soon, but state aid increased about 80,000, but we had a decrease in our projected extraordinary aid figures. So that brought that number down. But that gets us to about a, a million eight. Now, where, where is that million eight used in the budget? First use is, uh, it's actually a revenue, but it's a reduction, so it's a use. And it's the reduction of the use of surplus as a revenue for the future year. So we went down in that area about 600,000. Charter school payment increase, again, more than what we had in last year's budget. It's the increase, net increase. That's the half a million dollars. And then in the other two areas, we're just basically keep what we have, which was uh, the teacher and support salary increase, as well as the related health benefits. Again, that's all net. That's about as simple as it gets. Uh, as far as an overview, there are some other things going on. I already talked about the 2.36 and overall appropriations. Again, it kind of masks over the fact that we went in and did a lot of reductions to each specific budget. You'll see as you go through that there are some instructional uh, supplies and material that were, were reduced over time just to fit uh, the teachers in, so a lot of salaries in. So uh, there are some things that were reduced that really isn't reflected here. Um, the textbooks we changed, we're kind of going back and forth as we speak. Uh, we were going to do an outright lease for a large order of textbooks, but as we revisit the textbook need, we might not need to do that. It might be a smaller order this year, so we might be able to save a little money there uh, and go back to a direct purchase. 
And then there's just an accounting piece that has a lot to do with the, the money that swung from the general fund, not to get too complicated, but the general fund into that school-based budget portion. We had uh, an item, it's called uh, sick leave. Uh, so there's a, a liability associated with that. It was in our general fund. They, they required us to move that out to the school-based budget because it was related to the teachers and the support staff at, at that level, meaning in the school-based budget. <clears throat> Excuse me. School-based budgets, that's, we talked about this. This is a million two uh, change. Again, most of this change happens to be a shift coming from the general fund. And that's how that breaks out, instruction and support services. So um, and that, those are the respective increases. And the increase in support service would also include health benefits. Legal costs, we, we, the board takes this very seriously, so we wanted to expand the slide that we had in there. Uh, so if you look back to 2011, we were at $575,000 roughly. And it's gone down substantially the past couple of years. So what we have here now on a projected basis, um, I'm projecting in the 2015 budget, uh, we have about 180 that we project expenditures, actual expenditures by year end, but we have in there budget is about 210. So we're a little bit below what we projected when we created the budget, but uh, there is still a chance that uh, we'll use that by the end of the year. In the 16 budget, we're, we've decided to go with the same number, 210, just to be safe. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we can be sued at any moment, so it's a, something that you want to have resources on hand and available to deal with our, our liabilities. So $210,000 for that. Again, it con consistent to what we did last year. Um, special education costs, another large portion of our budget does not include transportation. The only, tra the only transportation that we provide in Hoboken are related to special education, either in-district routes or district routes that go to other uh, sites, which would be private schools for the handicap or other public schools that run programs for special ed like the VOTEC, regional day schools. Um, right here it's about $350,000 increase from 210, 2010 to 2016. Uh, I think that's running like close to 7% increase, between 6 and 7% increase. Again, that uh, isn't keeping up, meaning it's surpassing the 2% growth that everyone expects districts to keep inside of. So again, that's 6% right there, over 6. Administrative costs, uh, we're under the regional limit, about $3. Um, again, this is something that uh, is generated by the state of New Jersey. They have a regional uh, adjustment for this, the, the north, central, and south. This is the northern limit, and we're under that. We have a lease purchase agreement that went into uh, a lighting project uh, district-wide for various projects that had to deal with upgrading our lighting system to save energy. Uh, we go out until about June 2018, and this payment uh, is $207,000 in the 15-16 budget. That is in there against a five-year obligation. Capital outlay, um, you have what we spoke about before. We have the ceiling system, the Brant bathrooms. We have the energy project. It's just a, this is just the principal portion of what you saw earlier. The interest portion is carried in a separate line, a separate fund. And then you have other miscellaneous, which would include remediation or um, architect type fees. So, um, and the difference to, between the 523 and the 612 that you saw earlier about the capital outlay budget is about $88,000, and that has to do with equipment purchases throughout the district. Debt service, we, we do not have any more uh, debt service. It, we uh, expired uh, in 1314. Uh, so, this basically is a separate tax levy. Didn't bore you yet, Gary? <laughs> but uh, 273 for that, again, it's, it's something that when you raise a bond, and this was an older bond, to pay for certain items like facility, you would have a separate tax levy to offset that. You would raise a separate tax levy. You would have to record it in your budget. In this case, we don't have it, so you don't have to worry about it. People ask me, so that's why it's a slide. Pre-K uh, program, we spoke about this as part of the mandated programs with Abbott v. Burke uh, rulings. Uh, it's about $12 million for 15-16, and it addresses the free three and four year old uh, services for uh, pre-K. IDA, again, these are some of the resources, want to put them out there just so you know that as part of the overall total budget, no, uh, this is the No Child Left Behind, over a million dollars there, and about 660 in IDEA. IDEA is used just specifically for students with disabilities, and what we do with it is pay for out-of-district tuition. 
majority of that uh, uh, grant goes for that. Uh, types of revenue, I want to, again, this is something the, the board has asked to kind of go over a little bit with everybody to make sure we're all on the same page. Again, revenue sources for a typical budget is taxes, right? So local taxes, the general fund tax levy. You have what they call formula-based uh, revenue, which is usually generated from the state of New Jersey when they decide to run the formulas. They haven't done that in a number of years, probably coming up to eight years now. Um, but when they do, uh, that would be based on a lot of our demographics, like how many special ed students we have, regular ed students, uh, uh, English learners, those type of things. Um, I will point out extraordinary aid because it's something that comes up consistently. This is a category of aid that the state of New Jersey provides. Unfortunately for us in the district, it, we're not told about it until like now, like May uh, or June in some cases. I still don't know about it as I speak to you tonight. But what this is supposed to do is take money that is related to special ed students. Uh, so they'll, and I'm going to simplify it. So they'll say, okay, we'll pay for things or we'll run a formula based on anything over $50,000. So if you're running a uh, cost for one particular student for 75, that would mean 25,000 of that is eligible for this application to be reimbursed by the state of New Jersey. So we go through that effort, we document all those services for that $25,000, we submit it, and then we're told later uh, what amount we're gonna receive. So usually it's, it's you know, pennies on a dollar, so maybe 10 cents, 30 cents, 50 cents on every eligible dollar, but the state of New Jersey doesn't decide that until this part of the, their fiscal cycle. So unfortunately for me, I can't use the money uh, if there's a big variation one way or the other. I hope it's always on the positive side, but I don't get benefit of that until um, knowing, obviously, and then it usually has to be considered to be rolled into a future year to be used in the future as part of a surplus uh, capability. So that's formula-type formula based aid from the Again, the state of New Jersey, restricted aid can be both federal and state. In this case, this is state. So you have preschool aid, which we talked about, which is part of the Abbott v. Burke. And then you have this thing called non-public. It's a separate category. It's what I call a flow-through grant. It's money that goes right out to the non-publics, which are uh, parochial schools and other private schools that are eligible. Uh, and like I said, it uh, flows right through our budget. We just basically record it. Uh, unfortunately, we also ha uh, have the responsibility of administering it on some level. So uh, it, and it has to do with textbook, uh, nursing, technology, and 192, 193 are also special education related. Restricted aid, again, uh, you have some restricted aid. I spoke ab about preschool aid. You also have uh, federal aid that are what they call entitlement type grants, which would be uh, no child left behind. You have IDEA, which is entitlement, and then you have discretionary, things that you would have to put in a, an application um, through, through a, a discretionary process at the Department of Education and you would, quote, win the grant. So that would be a part of that type of aid. Revenue projections, this is what your revenues look like in 1516. The local tax levy is 41 million. We'll go over a little more de details as we go forward, but that's your total general fund revenue which would offset to the appropriation side. So you're looking at $53 million operating budget. And I want to point out on the bottom, which is your bu budget fund balance, and that's the money that comes in from the prior year. This is what the pie chart looks like. So you have the, the local tax levy, 77%. Now that local tax levy supports everything in the budget, which would include charter school allocations. Uh, there is a portion that, when generated by the state of New Jersey, they, they attach the state aid piece to it. It's a very small portion of the overall transfer in money. It roughly runs between 8 and 9%. Um, but the lion's share of that transfer comes out of the local tax levy. And as you see, state aid is about 20%. Uh, again, this is the roll-up, the, roll the summary of all of those uh, revenue sources. As you can see, the, ta the tax levy is the 4% increase. The other big item, <clears throat> excuse me, rents and royalties, as I pointed out already. Extraordinary dropped a little bit. School choice went up about $80,000. $80, um, so you have that $10 million, $10.8 million state aid amount, and then you have other type of federal resources there, which is semi and impact aid. And then again on the bottom you have your use of fund balance. So we went from 1.3 million to 691,530. These are the other revenue sources. Uh, we can go over the transfers to operating budget is money that is used 
from our budget to offset some of the costs as it relates to the pre-K program. And the reason we do that is specifically for uh, special education students. So the state of New Jersey feels that we're required to provide uh, special ed students at that th uh, three and four year old level with um, special ed resources. So we take a portion of our overall tax levy and put it in. And then we have grants and entitlement, which is that 14.5 number. Again, that, that would be inclusive of the pre-K money. And there's your total budget, the $67.9 million budget. Okay, so again, what's the overview? 4% increase, how do we get there? Uh, we have the 2% cap, which is roughly $750,000. We used bank cap, which was uh, the taxing, taxing authority that we did not utilize in prior years. That's roughly $695,000. And then we also benefited from in, in, um, increasing enrollment. And uh, we were able to raise an additional $92,000 with our enrollment projections. So that roughly is that 4%. Uh, fund balance again decreased, net, inc uh, net income increased, and uh, state aid, there's that $80,000. And again, that was offset partially from extraordinary aid reduction of 45, so just to point that out. Again, that's how it looks, goes from 39 million to 41, it's a $1.5 million push. And again, we utilize the bank cap. That's what it looks like prior years. What I will point out is 11, 12, 13 benefited from use. Uh, we had a very large amount of uh, budgeted, res meaning the resources related to um, the budgeted surplus from the prior year. So you could you could make the argument that that artificially uh, lowered the tax levy. So it pushed the impact off to future years, which we're, we are now feeling now. So um, in the last two years, 14 and 15, 16 are presented there. Now the three columns, you have the minimum tax levy, which is ca again calculated by the Department of Education. Uh, our last year levy is technically you can't go below, so it's the 39 million. Um, although they calculate that other number for us and then they provide us the resources as it relates to the bank cap. They, they uh, account for that in the software for prior years. And when we're done with this year, the use of the 695, we do not have any cap remaining for future years, except for what's generated in that budget period. Uh, there's the state aid increase. I think I hit that a couple times, so I won't bore you anymore. Fund balance, now not only do we use it, we use about 691 this year uh, from prior years. This is what we think we'll have at the end of this year. Um, so there's that 691 taken out of what we think we can uh, generate or project by the end of this uh, fiscal period. So we're at a million eight. So you, you subtract out what we're using for the prior year, that'll bring us to about a million one. Right now, I, I, again, I, I do this on a, a daily, if not weekly, basis. I'll revisit where we are in our spending, and we're, uh, we're generating surpluses from a, a monthly standpoint to make sure we're on target for these uh, projections by the end of the year, and I, I've done that in the last couple of days, so I feel pretty confident that we should be able to let, basically end the year like this. And if there is more, uh, then you have other options as a, as a Board of Education, as a community, to put into other reserves, like what we've done this year, which is uh, for the um, capital reserve, which goes for future building projects, and the maintenance reserve, which would go for maintenance uh, projects within the district. So if we needed a new HVAC unit and it was expensive, we could offset it to the uh, maintenance reserve. But again, uh, we should end up in pretty good condition at 1.1. That's after absorbing the loss of aid this year, 14-15, for school choice aid, so, which is what we were concerned about, so I'm happy to say we're still on track for that. Here's how it hits the tax pair. Uh, on, a, on a per year, per annum, you have the home assessed, the average assessment is $518,000, so that's $67.53 per year. And what we did was we just gave a, a grid uh, with various different amounts uh, below. And if anyone wanted to calculate it themselves, uh, there's a 13.04 for every 100,000. Now the 518 we confirmed with City Hall, that's what they have and that's what we calculated, so we kept with that. There are changes, there are things that can potentially impact this, uh, and it has to do with the city budget, depending on how they do with their tax rate. Uh, and also the county of Hudson. They can influence your property tax bill when you get it. But this would be our portion of that bill. 
what's next once uh, we take a vote tonight. Hopefully it passes, then uh, we move to finalize the budget with the state of New Jersey. They in turn then finalize it with the city of Hoboken. They can move forward with raising taxes and sending out tax bills in August. Business office, what we do is we not only do we finalize it externally, we make sure our financial system is all ready to go, all the numbers are squared away, and we open it up for uh, use. Hopefully by May 15, that's our target date. We, sh we should have no problem meeting that target date. Uh, and we basically say, go nuts. So schools can start ordering at that point in time to get deliveries over the summer in anticipation of opening in uh, September. So that's where we stand. Um, again, uh, I want to reiterate that additional details will be provided not only in the ad adopted budget book that we're going to continue to work on right after this. If, if again, if approved tonight, you'll have a copy of this presentation on the website. We have a Q&A, about 24, 25 questions that'll be posted. If anybody, I checked uh, the email, the budget email, we didn't receive any questions, but if anyone wants to still send one in, I'll put it on a Q&A. We'll put that up there and uh, then you'll have your tax assessment uh, number on that as well. So all that information will be available and if you have a question, you could email it in. And I think at this point uh, it end, ends my presentation. I guess we'll open for questions when we return. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, we'll have um, questions and comments from board members on the presentation. So, um, Who'd like to start? Sharon, do you have any? Ms. Angley? That's fine. Um, I'm good. Good. Mr. Biancomano? Uh, Mr. Moffitt, you briefly went over the uh, food services debt and how we're paying that down. And I know we spoke about it when we met at length last week. Um, regarding the food service debt or food services in general, moving forward uh, either this year or last year, we haven't been adding to that debt, correct? That is correct. Okay, so um, the debt will be paid off, I think we spoke about it last week, in about five to, or excuse me, three to four years, I believe. Yes, I think if things are, are stay according to where they are right now, trending that way, we should be able to do that. Okay, great. I was just curious if we were adding to it. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mitchell? No, okay, thank you. Ms. Sobolov? Yes, um, hello, this one, is it working? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had uh, had a question previously. I had asked Mr. Moffat about the surplus, and I was just wondering if you could go over that again, because I had gotten some questions from the uh, somebody in the community about the surplus. Sure. Um, the surplus that a district will be able to use, according to uh, New Jersey Department of Education, that they expect, and their regulations that would indicate that districts carry about a two percent surplus position, which is a percentage of their overall appropriations or expenditures. That 2% is used, uh, some people call it a rainy day fund, uh, a safety net. And what that is, is, is basically uh, a budget is an estimate for the future. And sometimes you have uh, good projections and sometimes not so good. So you have to be in a position where you can cover them. What a surplus allows you to do is to cover those items. So, for example, and, and what we did was we tried to articulate this on the Q&A mm -hmm. that we, we developed. Um, but what, what could that include? It could include uh, a leaky roof. Uh, you might have a, a small problem with, a, with a, uh, a roof where you would have to go in quickly and, and deal with it. Uh, if it's an unanticipated um, project or emergency, then you would have the op option to appropriate from surplus so that 2% then helps you cover that because it's an unbudgeted item. Another issue would be um, what we experienced this year, oddly enough, um, is if there is something that uh, increased. So charter schools, for example, is a big portion. So we were told uh, 200 and uh, roughly 15,000 um, in additional funds were needed to cover that. We would have the option to cover that with an appropriation of surplus. So again, that's a rainy day fund which helps those unanticipated changes. Now, again, that 215 is just because uh, charter school under projected an amount in the future, and I understand that being a budget manager myself, but unfortunately for the district, it puts us in a somewhat of a strained position, so it's nice to have a 2% uh, uh, cushion, if you could say, uh, or the uh, surplus to cover that. And the other item, too, it happens a lot, and I, my peers, we talk about it quite often, it has to do with special education students uh, that may 
uh, move into district. And uh, what that means is if they are currently in an out of district placement and they decide to move to Hoboken, we would have to then take over that placement, and that could be upwards, uh, maybe 100,000, maybe even more than 100,000, which would include the tuition, out of district tuition, transportation to that site. It may include uh, extraordinary services or related services for that student. So again, that surplus allows a district to cover that unanticipated cost due to a fact that someone decided to move into town. Again, it's unanticipated. We'd make projections, and I'm anticipating four students this year, but if I get a fifth or a sixth, that's when I become a little bit concerned about my overall budget, and that's the way to maintain a healthy position. Now, why do I call it a healthy position? Because the state of New Jersey, uh, when, I, I'm a, when I'm below 2% and they review my budget, they usually ask me, why am I below? And they ask me, what's my plan, what is the plan to get back uh, at 2? Uh, and they want the, the rationale behind the different uh, numbers. So in this case, this year, uh, you know, I had reported to them that we're going to be a little bit less than what we, what we can carry, and they wanted to know why. And, and I basically told them what happened this year was we absorbed that loss in state aid of $670,000 with, with the surplus. So um, that, they understood that, and they basically would allow it. Again, they would be concerned if we continued to do that and brought that 2% position down well below, and say maybe it's a half a percent or, or 1%, they might be in a position to not approve our budget. So that's so the reason are, are you'd want to keep at it. Or are we at 2% now? We're a little bit below, but we're, we're close. I think the question to me was why would you carry, it sounds like a, a lot of money, uh, uh, it's a little bit more than a million, uh, why wouldn't we use that money to pay for either the charter expansion or pay for some of the, the programs and then that would bring it down I would think to 1% or less than that so is that advisable does it sound like it well no it, it really isn't it, it's usually for extraordinary circumstances a charter school payment would be something that you would have to contain in your regular budget so you would automatically have to build that into your regular budget so you could sustain it over time so you wouldn't want to do the one time shot in the arm that you would be able to do for the sur use of the surplus because mm -hmm. again that's only one time uh, event uh, and you wouldn't want to do that to your budget because it just wouldn't be prudent um, you'd want to maintain that level and, and if not move it up again next year so mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to big what they call a budget cliff that's kind of what you'd right. start creating so you'd have to fill that gap in a future year and you might not have you might have more pressure to raise taxes and then crowd out other expenditures that the district may may want so mm -hmm. I hope that addresses yes, thank you thanks Dr. Gold no Ms. Jamal? No. Ms. Evans? No. Mr. Klepfel? I'm fine. I'd just like to thank uh, Mr. Moffitt and the business office for their hard work and also our finance committee for their hard work. Uh, there's a lot that goes into this and there's a lot of meetings and discussions and it, all everybody's time is appreciated. Okay, so now... Um, we go to public com public comments on the agenda items. So, Mr. Moffat, I don't see oh, yeah, can, can I don't, anybody. Grab I don't see anyone sign it, but if somebody anyone. wants to. Okay, so now we will move on to uh, consent vote. Wait, I think somebody wants to okay. sign up. Okay. You know, Mr. Murphy, you're the only one, so. Why don't you just go speak? <laughs> okay. That makes more sense, right? Murray. Murray. I think. Good. All right. Brian Murray, 1100 Maxwell Lane. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Moffat, uh, for the presentation. I'm still trying to figure out the cost per pupil spending based on um, <clears throat> the line item budgets and your presentation tonight. Uh, a lot has been made about appropriations to the charter schools and how this is um, stripping dollars from the district. Um, specifically, how the argument has been made in the past that, well, the district has a lot of special needs students and therefore, you know, when uh, the cost per pupil spending is higher. Um, and for the life of me, I've been trying to be able to kind of strip that, that piece aside to compare apples to apples, uh, non-special needs students 
cost per pupil spending, uh, you know, to relative to the charter schools. Um, in your presentation, I think you mentioned a number around $5 million in special needs. Um, there was a line item plus about another 600000 in transportation. You know, if I just do a quick calculation on the general fund expenditure of $43.8 million and take out the $5.6 million or so, and then I divide it by the number of students that is left, roughly 25, 2600. I still come out with a number somewhere 15 to 17 thousand dollars per student, roughly. You know, I'm just using rough numbers because I don't really have the specifics to compare the apples to apples. Whereas the appropriation to the charter schools is roughly 11 to 12 thousand dollars, which is roughly about the same number in your line item budget for the district's in-classroom spending plus supplies. So my question is, what is that number that compares apples to apples? And there has been a lot made about the appropriations and you know, um, a potential lawsuit to continue to fight the charter school's expansion. The question is, what's the impact on the district? Dollars for dollars, based on all of the numbers that you have here, if this lawsuit prevails and all of the OLA students join the sixth, seventh, eighth grade next year, whatever grade is, sixth grade or seventh grade, and you have to hire more teachers and you have to have more, you're already spending eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 just in class, would the district actually spend more money acquiring those students than they're paying out to the charter school right now? That's my question, based on the budget numbers that you've presented today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Pathway, this 1233 Park Avenue. My question is for the finance and facility coordinator, part of the budget. I came in the middle of it, so I didn't hear that. What I, my question is, when you talk about the um, special needs and special ed children, um, for the facilities, I remember a couple of years ago, we had a big argument about renting the pool and renovation of the pool. I mean, for the little kids that have swimming class. My kids go to Wallace, and I have a question, and this is no attack on the PTA. Where do that money go when they rent the facilities and I have an um, enrichment program and other, other uh, programs? Is that money in the budget, added in the budget, or the money that they donate or whatever, you know, to run the facility? Is that part of this budget he just demonstrated tonight? It is. Okay, that question saying, I heard one of y'all tonight say somebody confronted you in the community. I was also confronted in the community and almost had the biggest dirty fight with the situation that's going on right now in Hoboken, and I'm gonna put it to you straight. To me, it's discrimination. Tomorrow, I'm gonna sit at the board meeting. You said this gotta be approved through two other entities. The city council gotta approve this, and also the county. I, my question to them is, when you get grants for the special need kids or whatever, free or reduced lunch kids, we have nowhere to go. The after school programs, $120 for two and three minutes. I gathered up all my facts. I got all the paperwork if you want to review it. My thing is when they do these things and rent these facilities and, and create these enrichment programs and our kids can't afford it, I was told by one of the board members, not the, the board of ed, one of the members that's in the um, PTO, the parent, she says to me, well, so what? What if I wanted my kids to go to Harvard or Yale? I said, so in other words, you're telling me if we can't afford it, we just out of luck. And I thought that was very sarcastic because I'm asking the question not for me, but for a bunch of kids that got to pay for the Jubilee this year and all of those programs in Wallace. Every time Ralph, my son, bring those little flyers home, that's like almost insulting to say to him your friends could go regardless to what my financial status is I don't have to stand here and say it because when my daughter was there I was a correction officer making 65000 a year and I understand what she's saying because I was paying a lot of money when Mr. Stavetta was in charge of the program. But my thing is that's a public school. The same thing with Connors, the Hoboken High School, these are public schools. And if you're going to rent the facility and charge these kind of prices, the public school people and parents like myself that depend on those facilities, that's not fair to us. You asking for another can of worms to be open and that is definitely economical. Uh, or uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, segregation at its best. So 
So in other words, you tell these kids this summer, they don't have nowhere to go, they outside in the heat, but wallets to be open if you have $120 for two hours, you could go inside. That's sad. And I talked to you about this last year. I'm bringing it again to you this year. Now, I'm a, I, I, evidently, I'm going to have to go on the state level, the city council, or whoever. But I definitely want answers who are in charge of facilities that go with every school. And these, when they create these uh, different things that our kids can't go to, we deserve answers. Okay, and I understand what she mean by look at the audience, ain't no parents out here, but they concerned. And if they get the feeling that you don't care anyway, that's why they don't come out. And I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of parents that got to tell our kids this summer, no, play outside in the heat. No, we can't afford those programs. And I find it kind of disturbing because those are public schools. And if the school going to be open, at least give it to the kids that can't afford it. Not the kids that's going to pay a hundred and something dollars for soccer, extracurriculum, piano, and all of that other stuff. It's not fair. So please look into it and get back in touch with me. All of you guys have my information. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Waiters. I just want to clear up one thing. The band, the summer school that we're doing this summer is free of charge. The theater arts program and the band program, they're free of charge. Any child can. And there's the academic portion. And there's an completely I'm free. sorry, Monica. There's three you. programs that are free for the summer. And they, they're about five weeks, so most of the summer. That was sent out last week. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is anybody going to answer about the course for student? Oh, okay. Back up. I jumped in there. I apologize. Okay. okay. Comments by the board on public comments. Uh, we'll start. Sharon? I don't have any. I'm sorry. Mr. Biancomano? Ms. Waiters just came up and, and said something that this, uh, this budget process needs to go through two more approvals. And, and I believe she said the city council was one of them. But uh, Pat, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, no, anybody, no, no. that is not, not the case if we pass it tonight. It does not go to the city council. It would still, I believe, have to go to the, uh, Hudson County for the approval from the superintendent, as Mr. Moffat explained. But if it gets approved here tonight, it does not have to go to the city council. Correct me if no, I'm wrong, anybody. No. Correct. Yeah. No. No, it won't be going Madam Chair. This isn't a conversation. No, it's not a conversation. It's a conversation amongst us. Okay, Peter. I mean, Mr. Biancomano. Ms. Mitchell, any? Shh. Please, please. Thank you, Ms. Waiters. Uh, Ms. Mitchell? Um, regarding, there was a question now uh, placed about the, um, the difference between, say, the, the charters of uh, regular education and our school. Uh, district regular education. Just the top of the, just off the top of my head, is we have a high school that has sports teams, so that's more expensive, as well as uh, we're managing our facilities. We have aging buildings, so those are just two um, factors that I could just think of right off the top. Uh, Ms. Sobolov, you, um, does one of the administrators want to answer the question about cost per student, or could I just give it a shot? No, if you'd I like. I I Mr. Moffat, would you like to? I mean, because it's in one of the one of yeah, the is in the Q and A uh, here that talks about yeah. the um, the formula and JDOE formula. Right. Yeah. Um, to, to address the cost per pupil issue, um, if the concept is what, what is probably the best one available right now according to our budget, it would be the one generated uh, as part of the uh, advertisement in the newspaper. So the fifteen sixteen total budget comparative per pupil cost is twenty three thousand two hundred and fifty. Um, and what they do is they list uh, below that the various what they call indicators. So it goes like classroom instruction, salaries, benefit fees, purchase services. It goes all the way down various different uh, labels, which also include total administrative cost, operations, and maintenance. Unfortunately, they really don't address special ed separately, uh, which is maybe a flaw. But uh, the way the budget uh, is information is generated in that ad, it's controlled by the Department of Education and they, they, they say here in a notation that they follow the same um, uh, way to break up expenditures as they do with the taxpayer's uh, guide to education spending, which used to be called the comparative spending guide. So if you go on their site and you go in the finance area, you can actually click on and they give you a little description and some of the board members and I have been talking about uh, how that is broken out and what it includes. Um, so in that case, in the budgetary uh, comparative spending uh, cost per pupil, it, it includes not only our general fund, but it also includes the pre-K piece too, which is interesting because uh, it's hard to compare uh, Hoboken to other non, 
uh, pre-K districts. So that's apples to the oranges type of thing. So, uh, you know, I've been asked by, you know, other people about well, how to do that, and, and it's very difficult, and you really have to look at the offerings as well. So if you compare us to another Hudson County district uh, that's maybe a, a K-6, it's very hard because we're beyond a K-6. If you compare us to uh, a district that's a one school um, district, that's very difficult to do, so you don't have apples to apples there either. So it, it, it's not an easy task to find which apple is to compare to what apple. Uh, the best way I would suggest to do would be to uh, look at that 23,250, look at how that is calculated as well as all the indicators, and then try to find a like district, which in my opinion, would, you'd look for a, a former Abbott. Uh, and that would be a, an urban setting that has older buildings that is configured pretty much the same way we are, which would be a comprehensive K through 12 rather than like maybe a, an academy-based system. But, uh, but it's a little bit of research in the district to compare. But it's no easy task. Even the comparative spending guide, again, <coughs> used to have uh, little buckets that would have uh, population ranges, but even that's flawed. So not to belabor the point, it's very difficult to do that. They don't break it out for special education, and the best one to use would be the one that's in the ad for 23,250. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, one of the calculations that I think is, it seems to me um, an, easy, an easy one to follow is that the New Jersey State DOE says that the charter schools, their formula is that the charter schools get 90% of our general ed student. So they take away all the special ed, they take away the this, the that, the buildings, and they, they come up with a number, which is generally around 14,000 per student, and then uh, calculate 90% of that, and that's what the charters get, which is 12 or so. So to me, that, that seems to be a logical way of, of figuring that out. And then, but that's a tuition, it's, it's an average, right, not a tuition. So when, to me, when there's a question about what would you do, <coughs> excuse me, if all those students would come over, uh, people sometimes think, well, if, you know, 100 students move into the district, somebody gives us 100 times 23,000. That's not how it works. I mean, if, if 10 students moved into the district and there was enough room in 10 different classrooms, they could come into the district and not cost really anything, you know, maybe a textbook. So at the margin, a couple of extra students may not cost as much. Now, those students are particular because they have a dual language program. So if you hired a Spanish social studies teacher, a Spanish speaking math teacher, and a Spanish-speaking science teacher. All the other electives are there already. You know, the robotics, the art, the gym, the dance, the theater. Um, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that that is one way to calculate it. It's not as if 20 students came in from OLA and they would cost us $23,000 a piece. It's, it's not a tuition. It's an average. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Mr. Okay. Dr. Gold? Um, I think Mr. Murray's question is a little bit more nuanced, and um, so I want to go over it because it's a compliment. It's, I think we all agree that probably our teachers cost more because they've been here longer. I think we all agree that um, our facilities maybe cost more. But that's not the question, at least that's not what I heard you asking. Um, sixth grade is not on the table. The, fa the question is, what is the incremental cost per student if we were going to get seventh and eighth grade? I mean, that's what I heard you asking. And my understanding is, because we have so many fixed costs, the incremental cost of students would be a lot less than 12,000. So you could disagree or agree, but I believe your question is that, and I believe the answer is, if those students were brought into our school system, and nobody's suggesting that that would happen, but if it did happen, um, we would be able to uh, spend less than we're doing now with the charter allocation. So I want to acknowledge what I believe your question was, and that's what I believe the answer is. Ms. Jamo? Yeah. Um. Ms. Waiters, I just wanted to clarify. So I think you can go into the Wallace, ask one of the, Joanne or Jessica, um, and they can give you the flyers that were supposed to be in the backpacks last week. And it has the academic portion, um, the theater and the band camp. And um, I could also email it to you because I do have a copy of it if, if you would prefer that. So you can let people know that they can sign up and it is free of charge and it's pretty much all summer. 
And uh, that's one of the things we've really worked for this school year was to find the money for these programs so everyone could you know, have a safe place and get what they needed as an education component um, for the summer. Thank you. Um, Ms. Evans? Sure, I, I just wanted to add a little bit onto um, what's been said about the cost per pupil. Um, you know, th there was some discussion about special education, and, and we certainly enroll more children with more severe special education needs um, than the other drift districts in town. Uh, we also, as Bill Moffat, Mr. Moffat was mentioning, we also enroll more children who live in poverty, and you know, those children require more services, and that also contributes to a higher cost per pupil, and we certainly enroll more students living in poverty as well. We enroll about 60% of our, our students are uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch, which is a surrogate that the, you know, the state uses, um, and that's in comparison to about 10 to 15% of the children enrolled in charter schools, so that is a big portion of that as well. And, you know, that's not anything new um, that recognizes that, that children living in poverty need extra services, and, and that's what we're seeking to preserve um, and to grow upon. Uh, and, you know, just to, you know, point this out, the state realizes that the preschool program, the free preschool program we have in town is a result of the Abbott versus Burke decision, which sought to um, provide equality in education and recognized that children in poverty benefit from a preschool program, and that is why we have that. Um, you know, and the state certainly didn't give that out of the goodness of their heart. That was, again, due to, um, due to a lawsuit, the Abbott versus Burke uh, lawsuit. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Mr. Klipfel. Okay. Okay, and just, um, you know, absolutely right. It's very hard to create an apple to apple. And thank you very much, Mr. Moffat, for uh, your description, because I, I think that we keep looking within the community to figure out how to make an apples to apples comparison. And the real truth is to figure out how our cost per student, how we're doing as a district is to look at, as you said, a former Abbott district with older buildings that's a comprehensive K-12. Because that's truly an apple to apple. And even though that's not talking about here in Hoboken, it is going to give you a better measure of how we're doing on a per student basis. So thank you for, uh, for bringing that up. Because I, I think we uh, forget to look at it it, it, as what kind of district we are and to make sure we're making a comparison to what kind of district we are. Um, and also, Ms. Evans, thank you for bringing up uh, the academic factors, which is what that's called, because those support items that we uh, provide for our the children in that group aren't special ed. I mean, they're uh, reading coaches and, and different services that don't fall into that special ed category that would be in that general education fund. So uh, thank you for pointing that out as well. And um, with that, I think we are ready for uh, a vote on, do we need to do it separately or can we do it, um, Mr. Moffat, as it, like a we consent? Could, we could do it either way. So okay, so uh, do I have a motion to? Motion. Second. Okay. Uh, Mr. Moffat, please call the vote. Ms. Angley? Yes. Mr. Biancamano? I would like to make a quick comment. When receiving this budget a few weeks ago after the uh, adoption of the budget meeting, I began obviously going through it, and I began going and researching other districts' budgets as well. And, and a realization came up and uh, when I was researching other districts, Comparing them to our districts, obviously I was researching uh, previous year's budgets from other districts. And that's, we, we hear a lot that the state uh, needs to change the funding formula. And I completely agree that the state needs to change the funding formula. But I know Mr. Moffat and I had a long conversation about this last week. I believe the first step is they should follow the funding formula. They have kept eight flat every year. We can gain, as we spoke about, a thousand students next year and they'll still remain, uh, they'll still keep our funding flat, which the formula does not say. The formula says any type of increased enrollment, we should, uh, you're, you're entitled to get more money from the state. So 
and it's not just a Hoboken problem, it's obviously other districts as well. And I really think this infighting within the community uh, regarding charters versus public and things like that, uh, but we should all get together as a community and really tell the state that we should be receiving our fair share of funding. Moving on, um, we have to live with this, unfortunately. So moving on to the future, I'm looking at Dr. Johnson coming in, our new superintendent. And of course, she had to go through the same thing over in Boonton. And I believe that she really did a great job saving money for taxpayers out there. It was one of the reasons, it was one of her high points to me in the interviews, by going out to referendums and things like that. And I think a change of eyes is going to be good going forward. So again, we're raising taxes now for the third year in a row by 4%, 12% um, over the last, if you combine the last three years, without the public having a say on what to do with their money. And I just, can't go forward. I'm going to vote no on the approval and yes on the bank cap. Thank you. Ms. Mitchell. Oh, wait, wait, sorry. Okay. Uh, Ms. Evans. Yes. Dr. Gold. Um, I'm flabbergasted. Somebody's yes. voting to let us raise the taxes to 4%, but they don't want to take responsibility for raising it. Um, you, when you're elected, you either make a suggestion how to improve the budget or not. And if we all voted the way that somebody voted, then Dr. Johnson would come here with absolutely her hands tied behind her back. I, uh, um, when you're on the board, um, you have to follow the law. And there are 500 districts that move their election to November, which means by Christie's law, not our law, you, there's no referendum unless it's over 2% um, plus whatever bank cap there is. Um, if you really believed that um, the people should have voted for it, you shouldn't have voted no, you should have abstained. Um, this is a way of having your cake and eat it too. So with that editorial comment, of course, I'm gonna vote yes. Editorial comment. Mr. Klusfeld? Yes. Ms. Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Sobolo? Yes. Ms. Stromwall? Yes. And Ms. Tyroller? I want to once again thank Mr. Moffitt for uh, the presentation and especially for some of the charts which actually show why, how we've, the, the boards, that, uh, what they, we've been doing over time to um, keep this, the increases to the tax as low as we can. And I think uh, the people that this will be posted on the website, this budget presentation, and I would encourage anyone who's watching this meeting to review it and look at those uh, individual items uh, closely because it's, it's a very good picture. And with that, I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And now we go to uh, public, public comments. open public comments. Okay. Did did any did we have a yeah, sign up? I'm on a list. Okay, let's do the put the sign up out quickly. So, Mr. Enrico, you can go first. But then those that want to, um, there's a woman. When, it, when the expenses for the charter school continue to go up, do the public school children suffer? Mr. Moffitt, I, I know this is going to be tough. This is going to be a tough thing for you to answer. All right, sure. I, I heard you. As the expenses for the charter school continue to grow, does that take away? from the Hoboken public school children? It's not a QA. and a Just do your whole thing and then if we Well, that's my first question. All right, because I know, well, I know the answer. It probably won't be said in public tonight, but it actually does. So, and another thing, this is just a comment just from my observation. I, I, I don't know what board of ed the meeting I'm at because we, you discussed the charter school so much I'm, I, sometimes I think I'm at a charter school board of ed meeting. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I know this is a hot issue in town, but I, I mean, I think we should focus on what's right for the public school children, the people who elect to send their kids to the public school. 
all right? And this, this back and forth with the charter school. It's obviously, it's obvious they don't want to send their kids to the public school. So we should really focus on what we're doing here. And um, because they see the district, as if this continues, there's, there's really going to be no public school, you know, in this town in the next, you know, 10 to 15 years. But another, another thing I always say at every budget meeting, when people get up and start criticizing the budget, I never met a Board of Ed member who wants to raise the budget. I've never seen a Board of Ed member who says, you know, I want to raise the budget a million and a half dollars because we need it. It's just, it's just some of the things just take place. They evolve. And as, the, you know, as things start to rise, the budget's going to go up. So I, like I said, I never met a Board of Ed member who was happy about raising the budget. So good luck. Thank you. Um, next uh, yeah, Linda Kwok. Is it Hi, Linda Kwok, uh, 1125 Maxwell Lane. I have some notes here. How much time do I have? Um, I would just like to say thank you. That was a very, very informative presentation. Um, I, as a private citizen, find that very interesting. I'm a person who I consider to be very good with numbers. I understand the challenges that's facing the district. Um, so thank you for that information. I just remember um, when I first moved here and in 2009, I did not even have a child back then. In 2009, um, it was in the news that the state had threatened to take over the finance portion of the Hoboken BOE. And I was very panicked. I was very scared. I thought, oh my goodness, it's really as bad as I thought it was going to be. And I looked into private schools. Um, now we have been in the, and my children have been in private schools in town, private preschools. Now we have been in the district for three years, and I am very, very happy with the quality of the education we have received so far. Uh, my daughter is in kindergarten, and my son is in pre-K three with hopes. We've been extraordinarily happy and pleased with the teacher and the quality of the administration, um, the resources that are given to us, and I think also. Um, Private citizens don't realize you need to be involved. You need to take matters into your own hands. You need to help. You need to ask what the schools need help with. Um, I donated a lot of supplies to the schools last year because that's what they needed. And the budget does not budget for things like, um, what was that thing I donated? Um, treasure boxes. Um, bring to the school. Um, can I also ask the board if there is something you like to give? And this is what I learned. You cannot give money to the schools, but if you need Chromebooks, can we put that on the forum to say we need 30 Chromebooks? If you like to donate something to the district, donate 30 Chromebooks, whatever it is. If it's a material goods, put it out there. Um, I'm working on something um, you know, with other parents, and that's just one of the things I thought about just now. Um, okay, so I, I thank you for your services to the town, to the children of Hoboken. I think it's, um, I think what you're doing is wonderful. Um, we've been very, very happy and we intend to stay in the public um, district. N another small thing I like to mention um, is a lot of people mention technology. We, I think as parents, um, we get a lot of flyers sent home every day um, I don't know how much that cost. It's, it seems cumbersome, it seems wasteful, it seems not good for the environment. I don't know if that can be cut out altogether. I don't know if all that stuff can be electronically communicated to the parents, but can we give the parents an option to sign up somewhere and say, I would like to receive all this communication electronically. And that way it's also good for me because I tend to lose things a lot. Um, so I know where to go to look, to look at all these documents and print it out, maybe organize it when I need to print them out. Um, so those are just a few comments I have, but I thank you for your services. I know this is all volunteer work, so I look forward to help in any which way I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Patricia Waiters. Patricia Waiters. I never stand up here to rebuttal back and forth with no speaker. But it is good to hear them stand up here and say, I moved here 2009, I moved here 10 years ago, 15 years ago. My family moved here in 1954. And to actually see what take place with our kids, the generations in this school system, it is kind of nervous when I hear 
the people say, oh, I have a preschooler, I have a three-year-old, I have a four-year-old. But when you start getting in the fifth grade, fourth grade, sixth grade, their kids are gone. And we've seen this happen so many times. And, and I go to Brant every day. I was on an early childhood with you, uh, Miss. And it, it used to bother me because I literally would want to go to Jackson Street and knock on doors like Patrick Fitzhugh do now and tell these parents that lived here all of their life, come out. They do care. Get involved. Even I made the early childhood go down to housing authority to register them. And there's so many of them. To see their kids at home, three and four year old. I seen Obama say that last night on TV how the three and four year old program is so good and it's going to be productive for them versus them starting early or going to jail when they turn 12. And it's true. If you could occupy those spaces and at least see some of those people from housing authority and people that really need the program, I would be happy too. But you got to find the way this board, when you run for the board, like Mr. Mr. Golds mentioned tonight, whose hands be tied or not. You got to start running for the board following regulations from the state. First of all, because you all take an ethic exam, and I took one too when I worked for the assembly. Start following laws for the state and do what's right for the people, not the political party that put you there. We know how the old game go. So I'm not going to even waste my five minutes saying that. I'm tired of seeing our kids being put last. And as far as electronically go, we still depend on those hard copies. Everybody don't have access to the internet. You see? So, I mean, Maxwell Lane versus Jackson Street, come on now. People barely making it to eat that say, oh, well, we want to depend on it electronically. I was even told before when I spoke about this same issue, well, go to the library. I see the library jam-packed. My kids is there all the time. We get 30 minutes. So don't, it's like a restraint when you want to talk about, you get a little emotional, when you want to talk about people, economical situations, which I really don't want to do. But Mr. Um, uh, Gary Enrique said a couple of years ago, go on 9th Street at dismissal time, and it's very disturbing. And I'm going to leave it there because he was telling the absolute truth that was three years ago, most of you board members turned around and ran again for office and the same thing is still happening. And I went myself, took the pamphlets and begged those mothers to put their kids in school. All right? And, and they can't say I don't stay involved because I do. But if you go to 9th Street, like he said, and go review who's coming out of that school, it's very disturbing. And I'm going to start bringing these things to the state myself because I keep hearing state funds, state funds. 60% of Hoboken is reducing free lunch students, but the state ain't taking us serious because the people living in these nice, fine, luxury, everything being built in Hoboken got the word luxury in front of it. So you know it's not us living in there. And where is all of this money? They taxes is going up, but our kids still being counted as free and reduced lunch kids. And we do not have the same access. We do not have the same things that other people have. And it's not fair. It's not. We don't have those resources. We depend on the state. I can't say if Ralph don't go to Ola or the Hoboken Charter or the new Allegiant Charter. Ralph depend on the public school system. I don't have a choice to take Ralph nowhere else. And it's not fair for none of my kids or none of these children I advocate for in the Hoboken community. So if you're going to run for the board and be board of ed members, think about the whole community. Please, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moffitt? Anybody else? Mr. Murray. Yes, thanks. This is uh, Mr. Brian Murray. Brian Murray, 1100 Maxwell Lane. Uh, I want to thank everybody who uh, attempted to answer my question previously. Um, here's my concern is that, and you did as best as you could with, with what you had, um, I'm getting emails that they're asking for donations to support a, a lawsuit. Um, I've seen the board spend money on a lawyer to pursue the lawsuit. I've seen countless hours be spent by the board <clears throat> focused on the issue of the charter school. I've seen parents, you know, spend countless hours on both sides focused on the issue. And nobody really knows really what we're fighting for. I appreciate your, your, your answer, Mr. Gold, but I would be I would be, uh, it would be hard pressed to spend my own money without having a real understanding of, are we talking about $50,000 for, 
are we talking about five million dollars if all those kids came back into the school that we would actually be better off as a district again making those assumptions that all those kids come back into the school system and what we have to spend on you know 100 kids coming back in here just so that we have an understanding we can you know whatever that number is it is in this way we can make some decisions as a group as a community to say it's worth it it's not worth it if this isn't a conceptual thing this isn't a you know landmark decision these are people's lives that we're talking about and kids that we're talking about so let's let's get those numbers mr moffat i know they're difficult but let's get that number or pretty close to it let's lay out all the assumptions we don't have to agree about them but at least let's have them and let's boil it down and say is it worth going down this road is it not what's the bigger picture and, and make some decisions that aside I just want to use the remaining time that I have here to, you know, last meeting, um, I got up here and uh, I found out minutes before I spoke that uh, Mr. Bowley was resigning. And subsequently, you know, I've heard that it's been, it was a paperwork issue and it's been paperwork. Now, one of two things has happened here. One is that we, the community, the parents are not being told the whole story and there's something else that this is the official story, which I don't necessarily know that that's true or not true. But the fact remains that some of the board members up here have children that go to that school, Wallace, where Mr. Bali is still the principal. And for him to be pushed out, because that's what he was, was pushed out. And that's the, across the board, I've heard that. For him to be pushed out is just unconscionable. I mean, who are you gonna get to replace him that's better than him? You gave him no support. I've seen what his support was and there was no support to do the paperwork you know it's not fair to mr bali to, to hang that on him you know you're going to bring in some other person a revolving door when you brought him in to replace mr medlin mr bali got up there and said i'm going to be here you know from the foreseeable future for the rest of my career and now i don't know two years later there goes mr bali and somebody else comes in there is no consistency it doesn't help the children it doesn't help the teachers it doesn't help the schools. It doesn't help the district. It, it's, it's just unconscionable. That you, I, I mean, I think that we deserve answers as to why we're going to, you know, upset the apple cart again, again two years later. I mean, it's one thing when the superintendent bolts for the suburbs, you know, and then we bring in another one. But it's a different, you know, you had a teacher that, or a principal that parents liked, that kids liked, that people rallied behind, that was part of that school's fabric. And you forced them out. You did force them out. I don't know who amongst you forced them out, but that's the truth. And it's okay. Yeah. You know, you think that's a lie? Well, that's not what the word on the street is. That's not the word from people who I've talked Just, to who know. So you can no sit there and you can now, because this makes me angry with a little shaking her head and this and that. Now I'm becoming pat waiters because you're lying to me. You're lying to me. Mr. Bali did not want to go. You can ask Mr. Bali. No, he'll tell you whatever you need to hear to get his paycheck because it's important that he feed his family. But the fact of the matter is you did push him out. And you're going to have to live with that when the next person comes in and the revolving door comes again and the schools don't improve. And you're going to be, I don't know why the schools didn't improve. It's because of you. Thank you. Can I say something? I'm, well, I'm go, do, I, do you want to go? We'll Let's start on this side. You. I like to. Okay. Uh, that was so our now last we're speaker. having comments Sarah? from. Let me just speak. Oh, there's one more speaker. Oh, oh Sarah. <laughs> my apologies. I'm sorry. I didn't sign my name. It's Sarah Raynor, R A Y N O R, 1000 Jefferson Street. Um, I don't know anything about anything, but Mr. Moffat, you had um, addressed a question from an audience member that it was difficult to compare apples to apples um, as far as our district and trying to find another school district that was comparable to ours. Yet, Mr. Biancomano said that he had researched other school districts, and I'm just curious what districts those were that you said that you had researched um, comparing our budget to their budget. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, we'll do that in our... Let me, uh, we'll do it as we... Okay, so now we're having final... Wait, there's one more. Okay, one more and then that's it. Okay, we have to follow the rules and sign the sheet, but this is the final uh, person. Okay, thank you. Roseanne Versace, fourth grade teacher. Um, there are a lot of things I'd like to comment on, but the, I, I would like to thank, I believe her name was Ms. Kwan, was it Kwan? 
Um, Quack. Quack. Um, for, I'd like to thank her for coming up and speaking positively about the public school district. And it's very gratifying as a teacher and a member of, of the public school community in Hoboken to hear people say, I have children in a very young grade level, but I plan to stay in the district. And I think we need to focus on that. So while there has been a history of fourth grade or third grade or fifth grade and out, the fact that someone who's new to Hoboken is saying that she's really pleased with the district and wants to keep her children here, I think that's where we should go where we should proceed from and not bring up sort of past history to say you will be out. I think that's maybe for her to make that decision and hopefully she will be, continue to be so pleased with the district and all the great things that we're doing and keep her children here. So I'm gratified for that. Um, many of the teachers, just as far as like fundraising, there are websites, there's one in particular, GoFundMe, where I've seen certain teachers in the district put projects up on, on that website and people actually from outside, from the outside, do send money to help support them. So that's something that I think that you know maybe we should kind of disseminate that information to the teachers because there are things that maybe the budget doesn't cover, and certainly you don't want to ask the parents to contribute to. But there are people on the outside that do have a support for public education and some of the great things that we're doing, and they are willing to make some. Um, some donations. And, and just lastly, about the, the charter public and, and what the funding does. We have the resources in the school, and we could absorb many more new students. I mean, that's not to say that at some point it may, it may be reflected in the budget. But certainly, if I had an additional number of students in my class, that wouldn't affect the budget. So when the money is going out, um, that does have an impact. When the new students come in, it doesn't have as drastic an impact as people would think. It's not that we're paying, it's not like another mouth to feed if you had another child at home or you're supporting someone else. We have the resources available so that we could absorb the additional students. And it's not a question of why you know they're sending their child to another school that's that's not the issue it's the impact that that child not being in the district and the money going out has that's the real issue here it's not the fact that i mean they want to send their child somewhere else that's their prerogative and they should be able to do that but it's not like they're sending their child to hoboken catholic or a private school where we just lose the student we we don't have the enrollment which impacts us at some point and we don't have the money, and that's the real issue. And I think that's what is sort of missing in the whole charter school argument or conversation, and I think that's what those parents really don't understand when, when we say we want to fight what the funding does. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to have final comments by board well, members, which will include, which will include um, if anybody wants to respond. But first, does the administration want to say anything before I go to board comments? Okay. Yeah, you're good? Good? Okay. As I usually do, for Sharon Angley to go first. <laughs> Ms. Um, Angley? This is just addressing um, Ms. Kwok and Ms. Waiters. Um, I appreciate you both standing up and, you know, stating your opinions on the district and, and what you feel. Um, and the support going forward. I think our community has evolved, will continue to evolve. Um, and if we can get more people who support our district, utilize the district, um, and I mean support from any type of support, volunteering, um, changing the perception of our schools, um, getting the word out there that it's a great place to be. I think um, things will be different when you reach third, fourth, fifth grade. And I think they're different now than they were 10 years ago. So thank you. Um, Mr. Biancomano. Uh, Sarah, to answer your question. So now that I am the representative on the New Jersey School Boards Association, I've been going to many meetings these for the first couple months of the year, and I've been meeting contacts from other districts and things like that. So when you said, what are the districts that you look at, I was specifically looking for districts with similar demographics to Hoboken. Obviously, the charter school situation in Hoboken is a little different than other districts, but communities where charter schools were uh, prevalent with the amount of students going between traditional public schools and charter schools and things like that. So 
there wasn't many schools in the county, uh, yeah, in the county, um, who could really, who was really, really similar to Hoboken. So I was looking at other schools outside of the counties and things like that. And I did use a lot of the data to basically, and, and again, what I was trying to get at was that it's, it's certainly a funding problem across the state. Um, other districts are going through this as well. I've spoken to many of my colleagues in other districts, and, um, and really, it's the state's fault. <laughs> and um, I mean, I think that we should be really um, not so much fighting with the state, but you know, questioning the state's decisions by not following the formula that they're supposed to be following. So I hope that um, helped out. And I just want to uh, make a quick mention. People who come to this meeting every month know that I love to ask many questions in public because I feel like it's my right to ask many of the questions in public. And many of the questions I ask are regarding non-educational spending. So I feel like during the year, I'm consistently looking at things where the district can save money because of situations like we're going through tonight. So uh, to question whether or not that I did my work or not, I, I would invite anybody to sit with me, anybody on this board that is to sit with me the weekend before uh, a meeting and after we get the agenda to go over all the research I tend to do and to look at where areas of uh, non-educational spending is, is prevalent, such as, I mean, uh, all of you are, are tired of hearing about the scaffolding at Brand School. That's non-educational funding that I want to tackle. And I'm so happy that we are finally tackling it and we are going to get reimbursed for the state for it. That's more money coming back to our budgets. And, and so on and so forth. So I just want to say that you're more than uh, uh, welcome to sit with me one weekend before a, an agenda or before a uh, regular meeting, monthly meeting, and to see, and, and to, if you want to go over the agenda with me, fine and dandy. Thank you. Ms. Mitchell. Um, I also want to thank Ms. Ms. Kwan uh, for your, your complimental, complimentary um, issues with the district, I really appreciate it. And having a child that went from kindergarten and through high school, um, please stay. I think you'll uh, continue to enjoy and your child will thrive in our, in our district. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, yeah. Ms. Sobolev? Um Just making notes. Yes, I, I think the numbers do get confusing. Sometimes I feel like we, we talk in circles because people do think it's a, a tuition and I keep saying it's an average. The only numbers that are definite is the payment that we make to the charter schools. That is based on a per student formula. The number never changes. They have 10 kids coming in. They get this much money. They have 20 kids coming in. We get that much money. That money goes to the charter school regardless of the in our enrollment. So as our enrollment goes up a little bit each year or uh, fluctuates this year, we're uh, it, uh, uh, we may have uh, an increase of 84, nine of which are special that I think you might have missed some of the meeting. So the, the, despite the individual needs of our children, whether they're a general ed student or require you know, severe intervention or even outplacement, which could cost $100,000, our budget doesn't go up depending on the number or needs of the individual student. The charter schools does. They get paid per student, that's it. So the number I believe that I'm talking about is when they reach completion is approximately a million dollars or a million point one or two when the full expansion is in play. And that is the number that we're talking about that will impact, will be diverted from this district regardless of our enrollment or the nature of the students in that enrollment. And so that, that to me is in a nutshell right there, what um, I think it is, because that's a number that is a real number. It's their expansion times the formula, which is 12,000 per student. So that is about a million dollars. So I just wanted to ask. Thank you. Dr. Gold. Okay, first three petty comments. Um, the scaffolding funding took place when Jean Marie was chair of the facility committee. You don't save money by hiring a $450 an hour lawyer and you save money by making a suggestion in either voting for the budget or not and saying the budget's not appropriate. Now for something non-petty. Um, there is the, uh, a number of websites out there where teachers can um, put up projects where GoFundMe takes 8%, but there's a wonderful, as you mentioned, thank you, websites where teachers give proposals of what they'd like to have funded and it gets funded. 
Uh, Ms. Kwa, I know how frustrating it is when you feel people don't hear what you're saying. We heard you saying give the parents a choice of electronic or paper, and um, it came across loud and clear. As much as I would like to think the school board had power, we don't make personnel decisions other than the superintendent. However, I think the comments in support of Mr. Bali, um, when he hears them, I think will certainly make him feel better and make him feel good. But um, this is the God's honest truth. Any decision that was made or anything that happened was not the school board's doing. And now for the thing where uh, Mr. Mr. Enrico, I'm being serious now, and um, Mr. Murray and us, we're all tired about talking about charters. The fact now, we, we're spending our own money to do something, but if you think most of our time is spent, if you think most of our time is spent talking about charters, that's not true. In public it is, but this budget took a lot of time. Negotiations take time. There's a curriculum committee. It is so important that you realize, and when I heard you say it, I realized um, it wasn't that obvious. The board is spending its time worried about the children of the Hoboken school system. And you have to believe it, and if you think anybody is more tired of charter schools than myself, and I can't speak for other people on the board is, believe me, it's really quite frustrating. So um, I just want you to think that, um, I want you to realize that we know our job is to oversee the school system, not to run it, but to be responsive to the parents. And yes, it is really frustrating that this topic comes up over and over. I just want the legal system to run its course, personal observation, and let it be what it is. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Ms. Stromo? Well, I wanted to thank everyone for coming and, you know, Thank you for continuing to come, and I hope everyone continues and maybe bring a friend so everyone has an idea of what's actually going on because I think when you're just at the playground or at your pickup or drop off, you miss a lot of information. And I, I feel from the people that come here, they probably are more informed than most. Um, so thank you for taking your time on Tuesdays away from your family to be a part of uh, our discussion and uh, to thank Mr. Moffitt for putting this together. I, you know, it's been quite hectic. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on within the school at this time. So it's been really challenging. There's negotiations going on. And um, I know I've been asking a lot of you, so thank you. Um, and thank you for everyone uh, for being here and uh, for doing our job to oversee the school and make the best decisions for our students. And I thank you. Ms. Evans? Mr. Klepfeld? I, I would just like to thank Mr. Moffat and myself for um, uh, the, the work that, that you put into this, uh, fielding many of our questions, uh, the, the, the many meetings and the uh, uh, emails as we tried to grapple with this thing and uh, ask the questions and the answers we got uh, were always timely and appropriate. I thank you for that. So I'm done. Thank you. And just before we close, um, I just want to mention a few things. Ms. Kwok mentioned how in 2009 the state almost took us over for finance and uh, we are complimenting uh, our business office on the budget but the truth is the last uh, couple of years we've actually received awards for what good shape that our finances are in and how and and you know with 29 audit violations in 2009 many of them repeat and immediately that was um, I'm the longest on the board. I was elected in April 2009, and that was the audit that was given to us, I think, at that meeting. I think the auditor was here. So, and then the following year, they were all gone, and we've maintained that. So, thank you uh, for pointing that out so I could point this out. And the paper versus web, I think it's important to remember that, yes, definitely electronic is the way to go. We get the messages from the banks and everybody else if we're still getting paper statements, but there was a discussion this week that actually had to do with uh, the fact that they, we're working really hard to have everything on the website, but we still have families. We still have people that are, are not accustomed to going to the website to look for information, and we also do have families that um, really do rely on the paper. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing, figuring out how to do it, and I think that it'll be something that we can certainly have uh, the new superintendent 
kind of start to talk about when, at her, in her administration, administrative meetings with her heads of buildings to uh, come up with ways to cut on the paper because it absolutely is true. There's a lot of paper that we use and it would be great to be able to not use so much paper. Um, the, uh, this question, I think that one of the things that was great about the move of uh, housing uh, this, the middle school in the high school that a lot of people don't understand is that that was an excellent way to actually make some, uh, uh, to use staff, teaching staff more efficiently because the special subjects, whether it's language or uh, shop or art or all those classes, even math and English, we can use those teachers in both programs. So it would actually, you know, we've had discussions about this, bringing in the, uh, the children. If all those children came here, it would probably be one full-time employee, possibly two. But the likelihood is it will be one full-time employee per grade. So, and that would be, we saw the estimates, it's $150,000. So this is the kind of thing now, I'm, I obviously can't quote me on that that's exactly, but because we know from the experience with moving the middle school and housing it within the high school, we made many, uh, we were really able to use staff much more efficiently and be able to offer a breadth of um, uh, specials offerings that we weren't able to do when those, children were in the elementary schools. Uh, the, um, the Board of Education is not involved in personnel decisions. That is 100% the administration. The only thing we do is the recommend, recommendations are made and we, if we're concerned, we ask them to be explained to us and that's where it comes. But any situation where a, uh, an employee is leaving the district or coming into the district, it is at the recommendation of the administration. It's a personnel issue, which means that as long as a person is here, uh, it can't be discussed. But I can guarantee that no one, not one of the nine board members sitting here had anything to do with the decisions made about the principal position. That was an administrative decision that they presented and discussed with us and as a board we trusted and, 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 support, and we support it. Um, And I just want to say personally, I know exactly what I am fighting for when it comes to how I feel about the expansion of a charter school or a new charter school. It's exactly the way I felt about when the proposal came before us. It's exactly the way I feel about this. I, there's no, I don't have any confusion. If anybody wants to reach out to me, they can reach me through the board email, many people on my personal email, and I will have a conversation and tell you because I know exactly what I am fighting for as well as most people, everybody on this board that is supporting action uh, by the board to have the state address. And that's really what it is. We want the state to follow their laws. The laws come before anything else for us board members. We have to follow the laws of New Jersey and the laws of the government, follow the Constitution. After that comes our ethics and uh, our ethic code. And that's what we do here. And I can, and I, I can say without any hesitation that we are following the laws and we want the state to follow their laws. So uh, with that, can I have a motion to close? Motion. Second. Second. Meeting's adjourned.